Hi, my name is Eric and you're watching Standard Meta Coverage here on the sideboard. Today is November 6, 2017 and we just watched the conclusion of Pro Tour Ixlon. With it, the top 8 deck list and the next chapter in our meta. If you like any of today's decks, you can find the link in the description box down below. Also, while you're there, hit that like and subscribe button to help support the show. So let's go ahead and jump right into the decks here. We're going to go ahead and take a look at the 5 through 8 deck list. Uh, we'll start with Mike Seagrass 4 color energy. Now, what Mike has given us here, let's go ahead and uh, get that preview up for you guys so you can see what's going on here. Uh, so what Mike has given us is your classic version of four color what we've come to expect out of four color it's basically a teamer uh, energy deck the uh, as close to a classical teamer energy deck as you can find um, and only one swamp for the splash now this is kind of what four color originally started as very strong however the new change to this deck is Veraska relic seeker now originally four color was only splashing for the scarab god However, they figure, I guess they figured if they can splash for the Scarab God and hit the black multiple times to activate it, then they can hit the black again to um, cast a Veraska. Veraska actually gives these decks a lot more top end and also gives the decks a little bit more main board answer for artifacts and enchantments. Now, enchantments was always something that Teamer was a little bit weak on, and Veraska really gives it that. Also, when you start reaching these board stalls in these states where, you know, the uh, two uh, Teamer decks are kind of staring each other down, the one with the Whirler Virtuoso normally wins, or the one with the most energy production. However, Veraska can really change that with her ultimate, and with her ability to pick off certain creatures and things of that nature, Veraska really, really changes these decks, and we're going to see more of her today. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at his sideboard. One of the things I do want to point out about Mike Seagrass's list here is that he did not have any main board counter in the deck. Now, he was running in a main board a braid and some main board magma sprays. Uh, I guess he was a little bit more prepared for Scrap Heap Scrounger and things like that. However, that did not help him in the top eight where he was taken down by vehicles. Now, uh, again, he does have uh, more magma spray in the sideboard, more ways to deal with a braid. Now, you'll notice that this has become uh, more of a thing as more of, uh, we did say that these teamer decks would need to pick up the amount of a braids they run. Well, they've actually changed that by running Appetite uh, for the Unnatural. Now, Appetite for the Unnatural is actually really good because there's a lot of decks running cast outs and Ixalan's bindings. So if you are the deck that is running Scarab God, it actually may be more beneficial to you to run the Appetites for the Unnatural because one of the things they're going to want to bring in for you, uh, especially against white decks, is Ixalan's binding or cast outs to make sure that they can get rid of your Scarab Gods and a three mana way to instant speed bring a Scarab God back to the battlefield from uh, say under a binding or, or cast out is really really efficient so uh, appetite for the unnatural probably here to stay as long as uh, un until we have another big shift in the meta I would I would say this is going to be our premium enchantment enchantment hate uh, we've already been seeing it but I expect to see more of just plain appetite for the unnatural now a couple other things in the sideboard here we'll see is he does have some Nissa's steward uh, elements and a couple confiscation coups. Confiscation coups is something we're kind of used to in uh, energy, so uh, nothing really new there. Next, let's take a look at the Sky Sovereign Ener Ener Energy deck. Now, this um, this energy deck slightly different. We're not really used to seeing Blossoming Defense and Teamer. However, he did run um, Blossoming Defense in his Teamer energy deck. Now, this is also a four color energy deck in uh, the traditional sense of only just a light splash of black. Now, uh, along with the Blossoming Defense and a mainboard Supreme Wheel, 
you'll notice here that this deck runs three main board of braids come very well prepared for the meta um, he definitely was ready for artifacts and he even put most of the meta as not being ready for artifacts whereas he has actually changed his glory bringers to sky sovereign console flagships now you may also say that he might have done this because double red may be a little bit hard for his build as the build is not as heavy on red as some of the other builds uh, he's definitely uh, a little heavier on the blue than maybe more I don't know I, I, I would say that Sky Sovereign or Glorybringer should be easy to cast at turn 5 it shouldn't really be a problem but he did run the Sky Sovereigns it's not that much different from uh, 5 mana Glorybringer so um, I would say this is going to be a bad idea going forward because of the amount of abrades that are probably about to come forward I, I just don't think that this is going to be good moving forward here now looking at his sideboard it's uh, more of what we would expect to see out of teamer energy Chandra's defeat Jace's defeat negates appetite for the unnatural showing up yet again in this list mm -hmm. so multiple pros thought that appetite for the unnatural was the way to go mm -hmm. a couple cartouches here this is not one that we see a lot of however lifelink is really really good mm -hmm. and you know these decks can't afford double black or something like that for a gifted aetherborn so mm -hmm. you know giving a hydra a double black or lifelink that can really change the game for them mm -hmm. So uh, they have that, uh, a couple Death Scourge Scavengers, Confiscation Coup, and again, you'll see the Nissa Steward of Elements becoming just a really clutch sideboard card. So um, I would expect to see more of that. Also, even though there are some differences with the Sky Sovereign Console flagship, this deck is pretty much the same as Mike Seagrass's deck, only with the change of Sky Sovereign. Let's go ahead and look at our classic Teamer Energy deck today. Now, Christian was set for playing the Mirror. He wanted to play the tried and true version. However, unlike some of the versions we've seen in the past here, Christian did run two copies of a braid in his deck and it in the main board of his deck four copies of glory bringer and a single confiscation coup now you will notice that a braid has taken the spot of the two counter spells that normally sit here and that is um, that is the big change that seems to be the, the the major utility slot is this confiscation coup the number of chandras they run the abrade and the magma spray pretty much everything else is just teamer energy and that's kind of what you've got to run with well he made the call of facing vehicles and god pharaoh's gifts and oketra's monuments two main board of braids definitely helped him get through it uh, we'll go ahead and look at his sideboard here this is steward of elements again in his sideboard an additional coup and then river's rebuke now this is not a card that we've seen a lot of but this card definitely will change a board stall he also runs appetite for the unnatural and a third copy of a braid we'll see two copies of life crafters bestiary out of him and that's really to just help him in those control matchups to help him just continue drawing cards uh, we we seen this tech from gary thompson in nationals uh, it's really good tech and works really really well now another nice little piece of tech uh, from Christian here is Blazing Volley. I assume this was his answer for possibly uh, tokens or something like that. However, it could also probably be good against maybe Red Deck or something. Uh, other than that, it's a pretty straightforward teamer build. And um, I really like it. I also notice that he went with the fifth glory bringer in the sky sovereign Con console flagship so maybe there is a little something to the sky sovereign console flagship if you need more glory bringers 
Um, however, in this build, it looks like he's just uh, he's going for five glory bringers and a confiscation coup. That's a that's a lot of top end on this teamer energy deck. It does run 22 land and the four attune with ether, so it's a little bit higher than some of the others that run 21. But other than that, this is your basic teamer energy deck. Again, a braid main board. I think that's uh, had a lot to do with what helped him get to the top eight. Now, this next deck that we talk about, this one, um, my personal recommendation, guys, do not run this exact list. Now, one of the things that happened here, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to uh, butcher the, la the name here, but... Uh, <laughs> Mr. Matanon, we'll stick with that. Mr. Matanon played uh, played a Jeskai Approach deck. Now his version of Jeskai Approach gave him a lot of targeted removal, and this worked really well for him. It gave him some uh, control. It allowed him to play like a control deck. However, he got to play the blue white approach game. Now, one of the biggest things we need to take away from this deck is the fact that he was able to bluff his way to the top eight. Most of the time, he appeared as a blue-white control deck, and he did have the red mana, and he did have, you know, harness lightnings and things of that nature, but he was your typical blue-white approach of the second sun deck. And... Really what was his Achilles heel was as soon as he got to the top eight and the deck list were made public, it was instantly noticed that there was no Fumigate in the entire 75. And this is one of the things that his opponents had been playing around and would not over... Um, uh, overreach or overextend themselves onto the board, which would then buy him enough time to yet cast Settle the Wreckage or or get to the cards he needed to get to. So, um, yeah, he made, a, he made a, a, a really tough call. And this is a card game, and you, you can bluff your opponents. You can play on your opponent's, um, you know, idea of your deck. And that's one of the things that we need to keep in mind that just because we think that someone's on a deck that doesn't necessarily mean they're on exactly what we think of that deck and there could be a completely different take on it and uh, I I really really appreciate the the fact that this deck showed up in the top eight because it does teach us that that we cannot just assume things and a lot of people will just assume that he had fumigate in the deck and just would not overextend onto the board and it really allowed him to play that to his advantage. So this is definitely a next level deck. I mean, he next leveled the entire Pro Tour for the most part until the top eight, was, until the cat was out of the bag. And who knows, might have been able to just calmly walked all the way to the top if uh, deck list hadn't have been published. So uh, for the most part here, it's just a blue white approach deck. It has, um, you know, glimmers, settle the wreckage, disallows, sensors, search for Ascanta, lightning strikes. And if you get to building this deck, you're going to go, well, how does he have room for all this? And it's because he doesn't have fumigates in the deck. There are no fumigates. This entire deck works at instant speed except for approach of the second sun and search for Ascanta. Everything else in this deck goes at instant speed. So let's take a look at his sideboard because he does have some really good tech. Now his sideboard has a couple more sorcery speed action here with Baral Chief of Compliance and the Locust God. Everything else here, back to instant speed, including his uh, his secondary form of board wipe, which is supreme against tokens. You can wait till their end step, use a fiery cannonade, which is instant speed, and just wipe out tokens. By the way, Tokens did not make a good appearance at the Pro Tour. 
he's got some essence scattered jace's defeats negates torrential more torrential gear hulks pull from tomorrow and this spicy little number here the locust god now he was able to pull out some really really nice game two and game three wins and in game two and game three he was playing a much different game and we would almost always see the brawls come in we would almost always see the locust god come in and he was playing more of a control game in those game two and game three he was using the advantage the the normal game one percentage against the meta that approach typically has he was using that to his advantage and then just pushing a good value game with control out of game two and three and it really took him all the way to the top eight so you know you have to give uh, Guillermo Mat Matanon I'm sure I'm butchering that but we'll have to give him uh, much credit for that a, he definitely taught us quite a few lessons here with this deck today however it did look like a lot of fun and you'll probably be able to run it to some major success with magic online because people have to respect the fumigate he played his crowd he knew that he was playing pros and he knew they would have to respect the fumigate played to his advantage so let's go ahead and take a look at our fourth third and fourth place deck here now this is Raminop Red. Now we have seen a lot of Raminop Red since um, you know uh, Paul, uh, PVD took it to uh, Pro Tour Top Eight or uh, Pro Tour finish in Hour of Devastation. Ever since uh, Hazard has shown up, we've known that Hazard was kind of a force to be reckoned with. However, there's been a lot of variance to the red, mono red list. Now. This week we see a couple things that we've kind of expected. If you've been watching the meta coverage here lately, you've known that uh, we've been mentioning Harsh Mentor in the Mono Red list. Uh, last week with the Mono Red list that I pulled up, we had main board Harsh Mentors. Definitely thought it was uh, you know a step that Red was taking, and I still think that it is a step in the direction that we uh, we want to go to maintain Red dominance in the uh, the meta and uh, I, I kind of like this version of red being in the meta ha as it doesn't play as much like an instant win deck as it used to and um, red decks come a long way here does have a lot of reach and cards like harsh mentor give it that reach now one of the things we weren't exactly expecting to be main board is the Rampaging Ferocidons. Yes, this is a great sideboard card. However, I always just thought that this card was a little counterproductive with Kari Zev. However, if you're planning on winning the race um, just outright, then I guess you're not worried about losing a few points of life to your um, uh, to your Ragavan monkey token. Anyway, for the most part here, this is exactly what we have come to expect out of Mono Red. I wouldn't expect anything different out of Mono Red, you know, moving here forward. If you're running Teamer, look out for the Harsh Mentors. Pretty much everyone else, they're going to be boarded out against you as they are a little bit slow. But with Energy being about 50% of the meta now, Harsh Mentor is probably here to stay in the Mono Red main board. I would expect Rampaging Ferocidon to shift a little bit more towards the sideboard again as tokens did not do so well this week. Looking at the sideboard here for Mono Red, a lot like we've come to expect, more Rampaging Ferocidons, P and uh, Nalar, three copies of, which is a little bit more than we're used to seeing. Uh, I guess uh, they're really counting on the go wide uh, aspect here. Couple Aethersphere Harvesters, which are pretty standard. The other two remaining abrades to fill out the playset of a braid. So Mono Red definitely ready for artifacts here. And then uh, two Chandras and then two Glorybringers to finish out the rest of the deck. Other than that, that's our Mono Red. Let's go ahead and take a look at the Mardu Vehicles list. Now, before we even really get started on Mardu, Mardu Vehicles, I have to say I was wrong. I thought Mardu Vehicles was dead, I thought Mardu was dead, and that we were on red black vehicles and mono black vehicles at this point. However, 
Uh, Sam, I'm really uh, Islandfeld. Sam Samuel Islandfeld. Uh, so Sam brings us Mardu vehicles, and with his Mardu vehicles list, he only has one main board white card, and that's Toolcraft Exemplar. It seems that the vehicles list is still extremely strong. However, I'm going to say that this this particular list showing up had a lot more to do with someone being extremely comfortable and familiar with their deck. Sam clearly picked this list, and it it, it showed. Uh, the announcers during the pro tour mentioned it. You know, and he even said that he had been playing Mardu vehicles for quite some time. He was very, very comfortable with the list. And as this was his very first pro tour, I also agree that he made a very good decision in picking a list that he was comfortable with. Now, Sam does have a very well-tuned version of Mardu vehicles. And I would say it would probably be the version we will be looking at moving forward here. Now... One of the things that um, Sam does have here in his Mardu vehicles list is a lot of three ofs and a lot of what we normally see as sideboard cards. He has them main board. So let's go ahead and actually break down his list really quick. He starts with 23 lands. He's not really heavy on the Aether hubs. He did not go into the full of uh, four of this and four of that like everyone else does. He only has a singleton copy of Romunop Ruins. He's not really a Romunop Red deck, more of a Hazard deck. And he just uses vehicles and uses Hazard to kind of, uh, you know, close the gaps. Now, he does run four Toolcraft Exemplar. He runs some Fatal Push and um, Inventor's Apprentice only two Bomat Couriers. So his main priority is turn one Toolcraft or turn one Inventor's Apprentice. However, we did see multiple times today he just did not have a turn one available to him due to mana constraints, which is one of the reasons a lot of people have moved to red-black over the, the Mardu is so that the mana is smoother. Now, he is running um, Veteran Motorist. Oh, well, I guess that is a, a second white card in the deck. Veteran Motorist really allows the, his Heart of uh, Kieran's to do some real damage early in the game. They come down on three, crew, go ahead and crew up the heart, and when they crew the heart, the heart swings for five. So, you know, you, you also get some uh, additional scries to help smooth out your draws. Scrap Heap Scrounger, he's no stranger to the uh, vehicles game. Uh, probably one of the, uh, the most able-bodied pilots that we've seen then uh, we have P Pia Nalar, who, you know, she always has a Thopter riding shotgun. And then uh, four copies of Unlicensed Disintegration really were clutch for him. Aether Sphere Harvester, just absolutely necessary with uh, so many other things in the other aggro decks in the meta. And then his three copies of Hazard for his main deck. Now this is just, his numbers have been tweaked out. It, the deck works. The deck is very smooth. It did get him to where he needed to be, and it did have the tools needed to fight against you know all of the big boys in the meta. So if you do like Mardu vehicles, and you're um, a fan of the vehicles list, maybe you want to try Sam's list out. However, again, my predictions for this week, I would stay away from artifacts as I expect the number of abrades to come up. Although I expected the number of abrades to come up last week, and now we have a meta full of artifacts where they did not come up. So now with a meta full of artifacts, I'm sure that the number of abrades will come up. That, that's kind of hard to say when, when we were definitely wrong last week. We could see the rise of the artifacts, but we, we were unable to... Uh, to educate enough people to, to put in a braids to keep them out of the, the top eight. So um, get ready to fight a lot of vehicles, a lot of um, Oketra's Monuments, a lot of God Pharaoh's Gift. Um, the refurbished version of God Pharaoh's Gift. Let's go ahead and take a look at that. So this is Pascal Manyard. Uh, 
uh, Pascal Maynard. Uh, Pascal Maynard's blue white God Pharaoh's gift deck. Now this runs a lot like the God Pharaoh's gift decks that we're used to. However, he's dropped the black altogether, uh, and he does not run Gate to the Afterlife. His way of getting his God Pharaoh's gift back is a turn for refurbish. Now. Many times we've all seen, you know, Gate to the Afterlife. You have to wait around till turn five so that you can play it and tap it on the exact same turn. You got to wait for them to tap out, things of that nature. That was just not the case with this deck. Many times we've seen him go to refurbish, he get countered, or him just not have the refurbish, things like that. And he just played a legit game and fought his way through it until he could get to the point where he could hard cast his God Pharaoh's gifts. Sacred Cat being this is it guys. This is your your this is the best one mana one one you've got. Adanto the first fort is good in certain strategies, but in everything else, this is it. This is our new Inspector Thraven. Um Thrabian Inspector, sorry. Um, <laughs> this is it. We didn't like Thrabian Inspector at first. We were like, really? This is a horrible um, one mana. But Sacred Cat is, is what we were going to see. There's going to be a lot of Sacred Cat. He is here to stay. Sacred Cat was really, really good for him today. And let's go ahead and take a look at what really got this deck through. Four copies of God Pharaoh's Gift. He's not playing around. He's got a, a solid four copies of the of the card in his deck, and four copies of Angel of Sanction. Now, Angel of Sanction is no stranger to God Pharaoh's Gift, and that's basically what this deck hinged on: was just get a God Pharaoh's Gift in the graveyard ASAP, refurbish it back, get an Angel of um, Invention, and just start beating face with a 6-6 Flying Vigilance Lifelinker. Seems good. So that's pretty much the heart of it. He just kind of played around the fact that there's not a lot of main board negates. There's not a lot of main board ways to stop it. And then there wasn't as much hate for the um, God Pharaoh's Gift decks as you know you we might expect. However we did see him just do some good solid beatdowns with uh, Angel of Invention and end up even playing through more ne more artifact removal than his opponents had available so he did he did make it to uh, second place and I expect we'll see a lot of this version I think a lot more refurbished will get played um, I think with more people having to focus more on artifact removal and things like that refurbish might actually have a, a little bit of a decent chance we might even be able to see some like mardu um, gear hulks or some of the the old mardu versions that used to run refurbish pop back up who knows uh we'll take a look at his sideboard here hostile desert now this was uh this was one we actually seen do some blocking we seen it do some attacking yeah he got aggro with it a few times it was just uh it was a uh, very good card and in this strategy it actually works really well for him now he also has a sky sovereign console flagship now in this particular strategy I actually think this is much better than um, in some of the other strategies as he can easily just refurbish this back and he'll have it you know straight to the battlefield for a lightning strike and then a 6-5 flyer He's also got Angel of Sanctions, Fairground Wardens. This was a really good card for him. He brought it in in a lot of uh, games, uh, Scarab God games, Hazard games, just anything that he needed to what we would normally consider for a cast out. He was just doing it with um, Fairgrounds Wardens and the Angels of Sanctions. So that was your second place deck. Let's go ahead and take a look at Seth Manfield's first place Sultai Energy deck. Now, with Saltai Energy being the premium version of Energy in the Pro Tour, I expect to see a lot more hostage takers, guys. Uh, this is another one where I called it wrong. I expected the Saltai Energies to truly adopt the Bristling Hydra form and 
drop most of their hostage takers. That did not happen. Um, they are just as tried and true as they were before with the standard energy package. Um, not all of them were running all of the rogue refiners, but he's got four rogue refiners here. In the energy matchup, it was mentioned uh, by Brad Nelson that, and it was confirmed that he did do it um, in the energy matchup versus vehicles. When he was playing against vehicles, he actually sideboarded Rogue Refiner out, and uh, that seems to be the strategy. So, uh, you know, throw that one in your toolbox, guys. Hostage Taker, just really, really good card, especially if vehicles are going to become a thing. Let's steal some artifacts with Hostage Takers, guys. Seems like fun. Braska's Contempt, we know how good that is. This deck wasn't as much in on the Scarab God as there's only one main board copy, and then... Uh, He's not running the full four of uh, walking ballistas as it's not as good in the early game as it had been in the past and is more of a finisher nowadays. Uh, he also brought over a little bit of uh, his a taste of his U.S. Nationals teamer list where he was running the Nissa's uh, Steward of Elements. He's brought that over to Sultai Energy. I like it. I like the addition. And we do find his second copy of the Scarab God here. The last thing I want to really mention is Seth is also running Appetite for the Unnatural and Die Young. This is one we've seen in a couple of the very early versions of Sultai Energy. The card is really good and uh, probably one of the more underrated ways of dealing with Hazard, as this does apply Neg 1 Neg 1s to your opponent. Uh, one per energy spent and you get two energy for casting it. It is sorcery speed, but it is just an absolute way to deal with most problematic permanents. In most situations, no matter how big they've gotten. Other than that, that's your top 8 deck list. So, where do we expect the, the meta to go? Honestly, I would expect decks to pick up more artifact removal main board. Whether that is in the form of a Raska, whether that is in the form of a Braid, whatever it is you have available to you. Appetite for the Unnatural is great. If you're running white, then you're probably already running Cast Out and you just don't worry about any particular type of permanent in general. Uh, but for the rest of us, we need a particular answer for our artifacts and enchantments. Appetite for the Unnatural is really good. I expect to see a lot more of it. Possibly even some main board play. We may see, um, you know, the, I believe there's a, a version of it that has like cycling or something like that. That might be the white one. We might see more play of it. I think it's like Forsake the Worldly or something. I think it's white. We may see a little bit of play of it to, to help um, do things like, you know, pop enchantments and things. But I would expect to see a lot more enchantment removal and artifact removal especially artifact removal I expect to see a lot more God Pharaoh's gift uh, it seems to be a, like a, a lot of fun to play my overall thoughts on how the meta is going to shift in the near future is the fact that we have 51 or 50 ish percent of the meta playing teamer or playing uh, energy builds however energy didn't actually give a really good conversion rate over into to day two or into the um, I think it's called the 18 plus bracket or the 18 plus um, the, the point however it is they calculate the um, the decks teamer did not have a really good conversion rate uh, not to what you would expect out of what's known as a broken deck this is normally you know signifying that a lot of people are playing the deck but just kind of picking the deck up because they're not a hundred percent on playing it now because our meta is currently so diverse what I would expect to see is more people that were only playing Teamer because they thought it was the best deck. 
I would expect them to go play something a little bit more fun. Now, what that will leave you with is more skilled players choosing to remain on teamer. I expect more more players to go experiment with other decks and things like that and and to try other variants and in the near future the the people that will be left on teamer will be your higher caliber of teamer players. Uh, people like uh, Christian Hulk uh, that that just absolute phenomenal teamer players that are really good with the mirror and do not mind playing the mirror. So I would expect the teamer numbers of of actual how many people are playing the deck to go down however the power of the deck to go up at which point when we start seeing more and more people winning with teamer again more and more people will jump back to the deck and then we'll see the fluctuation all over again however this week with the the nice beautiful plethora of different decks other than the three teamer decks in the top eight we do have a very open meta, meta there are a lot of options for you to play a lot of different decks out there there's a lot of different strategies I recommend you find something that you can have a lot of fun with just be prepared for artifacts be prepared for you know make sure that your matchup against teamer is still there blue black control is not gone it did not show well at the pro tour but blue black control is still a deck to be reckoned with and um, other than that, I've had a lot of fun. I hope you had fun. We'll see you next time here on the sideboard.